All right, so I want to dismiss kids. If, if you parents would rather your kids go hang out with Melinda, which, let's face it, like, who doesn't want to go hang out with Melinda? Um, I, I mean, even if adults want to go hang out with Melinda, that's cool too. I kind of want to hang out with Melinda. I get to hang out with Melinda a lot, and she's pretty dope. <laughs> that's what you think, Wyatt. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's fun. So yeah, so today we're going to keep going in our series on embodied hope, and we're going to look at, at one more aspect, one more piece of what it means that we are human. One more attribute of, of being human, and that's sex and sexuality. Now, I, I do just want to take a minute and just recognize that, that this, this is a challenging topic. I'm present to how challenging this topic is, and I'm, I'm present to the, to the moment. I'm present to the fact that this conversation probably stirs something in us. I'm present to that. I'm, I'm present to the moment, even with all the denominational conversations we're going on, or that are happening. I'm present to the stirring that might be happening in us. But I want to invite you into this text with me today. I want to invite you into leaning into the stirring. I want to invite you to notice what's stirring in you because when something stirs in us, that always tells us something, right? Listen to those stirrings today. Notice what you're, what you're feeling bubble up in you and, and notice what the Holy Spirit might be wanting to say to us together today. So as we go in, I want to invite you to, to pray for that with me now. Let's pray. Gracious God, we just sang those words, speak, O Lord. God, may that be so. We ask for that. We ask that you help us to, to quiet ourselves, to slow ourselves down, to notice the stirrings in us this morning. Notice what we feel, notice what we don't feel, and notice where your small, quiet voice is and, and where you might be leading us today. So God, we pray for just that. God, would the words of my mouth be pleasing and acceptable, and would the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you as well? In Jesus' name, amen. Now, this is an important conversation for us to have as embodied creatures, and as hard as it might be, we, we can't ignore this piece of who we are and how God made us. Remember, sex is a good gift, and our sexuality is a piece of who we are. God designed us with deep desires for intimacy and for deep connection. God designed us with a sexuality. But I think what's true is what makes this conversation so hard is that we live in a culture that, that I would say is over-sexualized. Many of us learn from a young age what sex is and how we're supposed to understand sex. And some of those ways that we learn are unintentional, and some of those ways can be harmful and hurtful and maybe even sometimes damaging. Maybe for some of us it's exposure to pornography. Maybe for some of us it's, it's, it's abuse, maybe. Maybe for some of us, it's just a lack of education, a, a lack of conversation, a lack of biblical lens in, in looking at the conversation around sex, leaving us to figure it out on our own. Whatever it is, I imagine all of us have a diverse story of how we first understood and first built a framework of how to understand the conversation around sex. And the same, I think, is true about our sexuality. And when I say sexuality, I mean our, our desires. And I think what's true is there's no shortage of sources and voices that, that, that teach us, that want to teach us, maybe even unintentionally, how, how we deal with these desires and how we, uh, how, how we see fulfilling those desires going. I, I think there's lots of myths out there about desires, and we can see all around us different ways that people have chosen to fulfill those desires. I think we're also bombarded with voices and sources that tell us how we're supposed to view the opposite sex. I think oftentimes those voices and sources show us things that are hurtful and harmful. 
sometimes even within the church. They can be the, the best of intentions and lead us to a place where we view the opposite sex in a way that's damaging. Oftentimes that leads us to see the opposite sex as little more than objects to be used to fulfill our own desires. And yet, even with all of that, God created us with desire. God created us with all of those desires, and, and what's true is God creates us for wholeness and shalom. So when we start to see those desires clashing and conflicting with wholeness and shalom, we have to ask why. The, the reality is that wholeness and shalom cannot coexist with brokenness, with harm, with hurt, with damaging people. These things cannot go together. So when we find that they do conflict, when we find our views and our framework of sex and sexuality might not be creating fullness and wholeness and shalom, we have to understand uh, that, that we need to turn back to truth. We need to look to truth. We need to see what Scripture shows us. So we're going to do that today. If you have a Bible, I want you to open it up to 1 Corinthians we're going to look at chapter 6, and some of this we read last week, but we're going to start at verse 9 this week. If you don't have a Bible or a phone, the words will be on the screen behind me too. So hear now the word of the Lord. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, sodomites, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revilers, robbers. None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. And this is what some of you used to be. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord, and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall become one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, I don't know, I don't know if you noticed it, but Paul is, is really saying two things here. This part of Paul's letter to the church in Corinth is really two distinct parts and two distinct statements. The, the first section helps us see and understand and hold a framework uh, of sexuality in terms of the kingdom of God. And the second part orients our understanding of the physical act of sex and our sexual desires. So we're going to look at those two distinct parts today. The first one, let's look at, it's verses 9 through 11. And maybe you're familiar with these verses. This is a, a list of behaviors, or in Paul's words, a list of wrongdoers that will not inherit the kingdom of God. Remember, here, here's the list again. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, sodomites, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revilers, and robbers. Now, I, I want to be really clear today. These verses and, and this passage has been used by lots and lots and lots of people to guilt and shame people into different behaviors, to, to cause people to modify their behavior in, in sort of an entrance exam into heaven. And, and I just want to be really clear today that I'm, I'm not going to do that today. I, I'm not going to use this as guilt and shame for anyone. I'm not going to use that as guilt and shame for you. I'm not going to use that as guilt and shame uh, 
for, for me or, or for anyone. And, and here's why. Because Paul doesn't do that. That's not what Paul is doing here. Paul is, is not telling the Corinthians to feel guilt and shame so that they might modify their behavior. Uh, guilt and shame is not the most faithful reading of this text. Honestly, guilt and shame is not the most faithful reading of any text, let alone this text. Let me say it again. This is not an entrance exam into heaven. I actually think this is quite good news. Let me explain why this is good news. When Paul says the kingdom of God, this is not synonymous with our sort of Western contemporary understanding of heaven. All right? Let me, let me read with you this is from, this is actually from today's Lenten reading. This is from Luke, Luke 17. One, once Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming, and he answered, the kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. For in fact, the kingdom of God is among you. The kingdom of God is among you. Don't we often uh, look at, at kingdom of God and hear this to mean like the place that we go someday when we die? We, we kind of contemporary have this view that it's this sort of fluffy, cloudy place that we go when we die. If we're, if we're good enough that, that we'll gain entrance into this, that, this place that, that we call heaven later. Don't we often do that? But that's not what Paul is doing here. Paul is saying something different, and Jesus himself says something different about the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God is actually right here. So when we read Paul's words here in this list of behaviors or qualities, I say again, this is not an entrance exam. Rather, this is a, a list of qualities and behaviors that are present in the kingdom of God. And it's interesting, right? If, if we read these words as an entrance exam uh, for the place that we go later after we die, we have to be really honest, none of us would pass that exam, would we? Not one single one of us would pass that exam. There's just no way to understand this passage as an entrance exam and good news. Because we'd all fail. So we have to ask then, if Paul's not advocating for an entrance exam, it, how are we to understand this list of behaviors? L let me say again, the kingdom of God is not the place that we go when we die someday. The kingdom of God is already present here and now. When Jesus rose from the tomb, took on a physical body, and ascended into heaven to be with the Father and gave the Holy Spirit, Jesus initiated the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God that is present in part, though not complete, present in part even today. A kingdom that's defined by flourishing and shalom and wholeness. When we see signs of healing, when we see signs of rest, when we see signs of wholeness, when we feel ourselves grow by the Holy Spirit, we can be reminded that we are present in the kingdom of God. Present in the only kingdom that's characterized by flourishing in shalom. So if we understand that to be the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God is present here and now, though not complete, present here and now, Paul's list of behaviors and habits, it, it, it's actually a list of behaviors that are not native to the kingdom. It's a list of behaviors that are not native to the kingdom of God. These are habits and behaviors that do not produce flourishing and wholeness. They do not produce shalom. These might be habits and behaviors that are prominent in other kingdoms, but these are not behaviors and qualities that are prominent and known and, and advocated for in the kingdom of God, and certainly not by its citizens. In verse 11, Paul says, This is what some of you used to be, but you were sanctified, you were washed, you were sanctified and justified in the name of the Lord. Do you notice there? He doesn't say, but you convinced yourself to behave a different way. He didn't say, but you stopped doing the things that you've always done. Paul says, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord. Notice who the one doing the action is. It's not the Corinthians. It's God. It's the Holy Spirit. Paul's words remind us that even today, even in us, just like 
he said about the Corinthians, the Holy Spirit is present in us. Remember, we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. Why? To shape us and to mold us and to make us new. It means the Holy Spirit is working to make us fit in the kingdom. To fit in a place where everything, including sex and sexuality, are instruments of our own wholeness and our own shalom. Now, let's also not forget what's on the rest of this list. I, I, I think if we're honest, oftentimes we only remember a couple of things that are on this list, but let's remember what else is on this list. In Greek, the word that gives us greed actually means bad business practice or taking advantage of people or withholding from someone what's theirs or taking from someone what's theirs. Or the word reviler, this actually means gossiper. This means gossiper. In the kingdom of God, even the kingdom that's here now, none of these things are native to the kingdom of God, and it's only because the Holy Spirit empowers us to be different, empowers us to desire different. As the Holy Spirit does that work, then we begin to look more and more like the kingdom of God. This is the first section. The framework of understanding that the kingdom of God is here and now, and the Holy Spirit is shaping each one of us to fit the kingdom, to reflect the kingdom, to reflect wholeness and shalom. But here's the second, here's the second section. It's verses 12 through 20. And, and Paul addresses the actual physical act of sex and also the desires that lie underneath those. Corinth was a society similar to to ours, in a sense that Corinth was very sexualized. The, the Greek culture in general is, was very sexualized. And in this last part of chapter 6, and even getting into chapter 7, I think Paul calls out a couple attitudes uh, of the, the people in Corinth that I think are similar to what we see today. The first view that he calls out is seeing sex and sexual desire as an appetite. That just like when we get hungry and go to the fridge, people in Corinth see their sexual desire as just an appetite, something to be fulfilled when it rises up in them. But here's the other attitude, and it's on the complete other end of the spectrum, and it's this, that sex is bad. It's dirty, it's shameful, it's something to be avoided, it's not something for the church at all. If you remember, if you are here last week, Paul writes this part of his letter as a diatribe. And, and what that means is, he creates an argument. He writes as the people in Corinth so that he can then advocate for something different. In chapter 7, the very first verse of chapter 7, he writes as the Corinthians, and he says, Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, the Corinthians wrote, it is well for a man not to touch a woman. You see those two poles? You see the two poles, the two attitudes that we see there? I think we see both of this today. I think we see examples where, where sexual, sexual desire is viewed as an appetite to be fulfilled. But I think we just as often see instances where even saying the word sex is taboo or shameful. And Paul, interestingly enough, doesn't advocate for either of those. He doesn't advocate for either of those. Rather, I think Paul shows us in his writing that that, that sex is so positive, so beautiful, that, that we shouldn't just seek it out with just anyone anywhere. And I think he shows us, as he continues to write, I think he shows us that sex is not something to be seen as shameful or dirty or bad or to be avoided by the church. Right? Notice the words he uses. He talks about the, the Corinthians joining with a prostitute. He says, the two shall become one flesh. And any time a, a phrase like this comes up, it's important. Here's why. Because it calls back to another point in Scripture. What we know in, in Scripture is we interpret Scripture with other Scripture. Right? So this calls back to Genesis 2. If you remember Genesis 2, uh, we, we learn about um, Adam and Eve's relationship as spouses and Genesis 2.24 says a, a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife and becomes one flesh. If you've been to a wedding, you probably know these, these words. 
But one flesh is not just about physical bodies. It's not just about physical union. Yes, there is obviously physical union in the act of sex, but flesh here means so much more. Becoming one flesh. Becoming one flesh is about wholly giving yourself to another. Tim Keller, I, I listened to a couple sermons by Tim Keller and used some of his, his thoughts in my prep this week. I want to give Tim Keller some credit. But he says the word donate. Becoming one flesh is like donating yourself wholly to one another. See, what might feel like simply a, a physical union is, is not. It's, it's about so much more. It's literally two people becoming one, and it's, and it's beautiful. It, it's a gift. This, then, is one reason why God gives boundaries ar- around sex in Scripture. Because I, sex can't help but do what sex does. Right? Sex can't help but create union. It can't help but create community. It can't help but create vulnerability. It can't help but take two and make into one. No matter our intention, no matter what we hope happens, this is what happens. Scripture shows us, Paul affirms that this happens no matter what we intend. Paul gives us this framework of what it means that sex is not just an appetite, but it's also not dirty. It's also not shameful. Here's how I want to close. Paul gives us a a very high view. A very high view. He puts a lot of value, I should say, in his understanding of sex and our sexuality. And it's a view that reminds us that these things are very important, but he also reminds us that they are not all important. And let me say what I mean by that. We have a tendency to make our sex, uh, sex and sexuality our identity, who, who we are, h- how we live, what we're about. We can, we can make even sex and sexuality an idol. We can elevate it to a level that God didn't intend for us to elevate it in ourselves and also in others. We can make it all important by viewing sex as an appetite to be fulfilled, or we can make it all important by trying to avoid it and giving so much attention to try to avoid it. We can also make it all important by making it our identity or making what we believe about our own sexuality our identity. That's not the level that God calls us to view these things. Let me say again, sex and sexuality are very important. They are important enough that we as Trinity Church, we we have a position on human sexuality. We have a theological statement and stance on these things, and, and it's on our website. It's public for anyone to see. It's important enough that we speak on these things. But here's the caution. Here's the caution. When we make sex and sexuality all important, we can begin to assume a posture that Scripture doesn't tell us to take. When sex and sexuality become all important, they can become an entrance exam, like we talked about earlier. At worst, they can become an entrance exam into this very sanctuary or sanctuaries just like this across the world. When sex and sexuality become all important, when they become our identity, it can create a posture that is extremely harmful, extremely alienating, and extremely damaging to anyone that doesn't fit our level of all importance. I think of people that struggle with pornography. I think of people that might be addicted to sexual behavior. I think of people that might experience same-sex attraction. When we make sex and sexuality all important, if we're not careful, we can create barriers to them for wholeness and shalom. And when we put up barriers, that doesn't create shalom, that destroys shalom. But remember, Paul doesn't advocate for anything goes, not even close. Paul advocates for the Holy Spirit to do what the Holy Spirit does.
Paul advocates to allow the Holy Spirit to work in, in you, in me, and in everyone else. To allow the Holy Spirit to shape and mold and transform people into the reflection of the kingdom of God. Whole. Flourishing. Together. In community. In community. Together. See, I think of this list of behaviors and qualities that, that Paul gives in, in verse 11, these, these things that don't reflect the kingdom of God, and I, I'm reminded that, that you could put one of those labels on every single one of us. We could all wear one of those labels from this passage in 1 Corinthians. But I'm also reminded that Jesus doesn't see you Jesus doesn't see me with those labels. When Jesus looks at you, he doesn't look at you and say, there's a fornicator or an adulterer or a gossiper or a drunkard. No. No. Because of the Holy Spirit's work in you, sees you as a beloved child of God, a beloved daughter or a beloved son of God. He sees you as one that bears his divine image. He sees you as as one that Jesus invites to himself. Remember John 15, Jesus says, Come, abide in me. If you hope to bear fruit, I will cause you to bear fruit. Abide in me. He doesn't say, Come and and, uh, change your behavior. He says, Come and abide in me. I will change you by the work of the Holy Spirit. He sees you as one to which he gives his yoke. You remember last week the yoke that is gentle, the yoke that's easy. He sees you as one that he loves deeply, as one that he wants to shape and mold into wholeness, into flourishing, in, into one that reflects the kingdom of God, each and every one of you. This is the good news. This is the good news. Entrance exams are not good news, but the promise to be made new is good news. The promise to be made new, even when we can't do it ourselves, this is the good news. Do it yourself is not good news. Come to me and I will transform you by the Spirit. That is good news. Every part of us being made new is a good news. The gossipy parts, the gossipy parts are made new. The greedy parts are made new. And yes, even the parts that reflect sexual sin are made new. This is good news. This is good news that we're shaped into a Genesis 1 and 2 wholeness. Remember the garden. The garden is the picture of who we are designed to be all along. And the promise is that we'll be made into that, in part now and fully when we get to see Jesus. It's good news. Here's the last thing I want to say about this. In chapter 7, Paul goes on to write about, about marriage. And, and wrapped up in his words about marriage is also his words about sex. And he, he says that marriage and sex are not commands. They're not commands. They're, they're gifts. They're good gifts. And what, what I'm present to is that many of our brothers and sisters live a, a, a life of singleness. And we even have brothers and sisters that experience same-sex attraction and live a life of celibacy to honor God. We know that sex and sexuality cannot be our identity when our identity would leave our brothers and sisters out. The kingdom is a kingdom of inclusion, not exclusion. This is not our identity. It's a gift. And let me say more about this gift. This gift of sex and sexuality is a foretaste. It's a foretaste of what we truly desire. It's a foretaste of what we truly desire. A foretaste of the relationship that we will one day fully have complete with Jesus. C.S. Lewis wrote this. Creatures aren't born with desires unless satisfaction exists. Sex and sexuality are pointers. Pointers to the real satisfaction that that, that we seek. Satisfaction to be fully and completely known by another. Satisfaction for our desire to be fully vulnerable and to show up authentically who God created us to be, wrapped up in Christ with no mask, no false self. 
satisfaction for, for the desire to be in deep union and community with another, safely held. These are things that, that, that we feel being fulfilled w- w- in sex and sexuality, and however, it is but a foretaste. It's but a foretaste that points to something else. I actually don't believe the gift of sex is really even about our physical desires or even our physical satisfaction. I believe that under all of that is our desire that these, that, that these longings might be fulfilled by the only one that can actually fill them. The foretaste of a complete relationship with Jesus. Friends, Jesus is the only one that can satisfy these desires. Sex is a a foretaste pointing to that. May we not lose sight of that. May we not lose sight of that. May we remember that everything else that we seek to fulfill those desires falls short, will fail us. St. Augustine, maybe you've heard uh, St. Augustine. He's an early church theologian from the 300s. He's known in part for writing something called Confessions. And in his writing called Confessions, he he writes this, and maybe you've heard this before. He writes this to and about God. He says, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Sex and sexuality, these are gifts. These are part of the way that God's designed us, but even in these, our hearts will continue to be restless. Our hearts will continue to be restless. It's it's my prayer today that your heart begins to find rest in the only source that can give you rest. It's my prayer today that no matter what you've felt stir up in you this morning— that you'd be reminded that your true identity is not sex or sexuality or what you even believe about sexuality. Your identity, as Paul would say, is wrapped up completely in the person of Jesus. Your identity is wrapped up completely in the person of Jesus and who you are because of the Holy Spirit's union and uniting with him. You are a beloved daughter and a beloved son of God. You are being shaped and molded to look more and more like the kingdom of God, to live more and more like the kingdom of God, to love more and more like the kingdom of God. That these behaviors and qualities that aren't native to the kingdom of God, you're being shaped that those are less and less prominent in your own life. I don't know about you, but Paul uses the word that you were sanctified. I don't know about you, but Sometimes this process of sanctification feels pretty slow, doesn't it? Sometimes it feels like we just revert back into our old selves. Sometimes it doesn't even feel like we've been made new. Friends, would you remember the promise that you have been made new? That if the Holy Spirit is dwelling inside you, you have been made new, and sanctification is a long, slow process. Sanctification is a long, slow process. Reflecting the kingdom of God is a long, slow process. May we have compassion for ourselves. May we not place these labels upon ourselves. May we trust that God sees us as children. And may we have compassion with others. May we remember who we are. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for giving us a new name, for giving us a new identity, for calling us your own. We give you thanks that when you see us, because of Jesus, because of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, you don't see us as greedy. You don't see us as revilers. You see us as your own. God, we pray that these qualities no longer find a home in our hearts. We ask that you allow us to submit a posture that that you can remove them from our hearts. God, take them away. We, We wish to reflect the kingdom. We desire to reflect the kingdom and not any of these things 
that are so prominent in other kingdoms. God, would you do that work in us today? And until the very day that we see Jesus, would you continue that work? God, we love you and we praise you for who you are and how you love us. 